I'll make this short, but Bob Costanza is really one of the leading ecological economists in the world. He's figured out how we measure the value of nature, of resources, of things that we don't include and haven't included in the GDP. Uh, how we figure out what those things mean to us. And he works in the field of uh, ecosystem services, about, about kind of in, in fixing up our environment for, for all of us and understanding that that has a value. Bob has been, uh, until right now, a professor at Portland State University. He was the head of the Gunn Institute at the University of Vermont before that. And Bob has been a leader in the United Nations uh, effort to create a new economic paradigm, uh, was one of the key speakers at the, at the conference in uh, New York in April. And we uh, are hoping we won't have any serious technical difficulties. <laughs> Why don't, we, why don't we bring up the first slide? Um, the, the first slide just shows the, uh, the website for this well-being and happiness um, event that was sponsored by the government of Bhutan uh, back in April. It gives a little bit of detail about that. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, and the website there is listed. Uh, and as you, as you probably know, Bhutan is really heavily um, invested in moving this agenda forward of developing a new economic paradigm and development paradigm based on happiness and well-being. And I think that's, uh, that's going to be an important process over the, over the coming years and it will really um, bring these issues uh, more to the fore, put them in front of, of, uh, of many different levels of both government and non-governmental organizations. Go to the next slide. So this one should be telling you about um, practical problem solving requires integration of these three elements. And I want to focus a bit on the first one there, the, the idea of a vision. And we have to have an adequate vision, not only of how the world works, our scientific approach, but also of how we would like the world to be, our, our goals for the future. I think this is where the sustainability and, and happiness and well-being agendas really uh, come to the fore. We need to change our goals. Uh, going forward for for society. It's becoming clear that our, our current system is not sustainable and it's also not desirable. And we're learning more about how the world works, the scientific understanding of both the biophysical world but also the human psychology and uh, the whole field of positive psychology uh, is, is, uh, is making advances there. So we need to integrate that understanding with our a new vision of our goals and, and make those make um, appropriate tools and analytical techniques to, uh, to move us forward in that direction and also to devise institutions and policies and implementation strategies that are appropriate to this new vision. So if you go on to the next slide, um, <clears throat> you have probably seen some version of this diagram where it's becoming clear that we are facing uh, planetary boundaries or have exceeded our biophysical planetary boundaries, in particular uh, climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, the nitrogen cycle, several others are approaching uh, the safe operating space for humanity. This is based on the idea that, that we are approaching, or if we haven't already crossed some, some important tipping points in the biophysical environment. Uh, there are limits to our biophysical ecological life support system that are becoming better recognized and better, better understood. Next slide. Um, we also know that we're facing um, severe resource constraints, uh, particularly um, uh, oil and gas. And, and we can see from this one that, that um, uh, we have probably already passed peak oil production globally. Uh, so <clears throat> the point is um, <clears throat> we are facing constraints both on the supply side and on the, uh, the sink side of our, of our current economic model. Go to the next slide. Now you should be looking at a, uh, a cartoon here showing people lining up to go to see a reassuring lie rather than an inconvenient truth. Uh, so the strategy in the past, I think, from the environmental movement and, and others has been to point out these, these, uh, these problems with our, our boundaries, our resource constraints, etc., uh, but not to really provide a compelling um, alternative movie uh, to, go, to go and see uh, where the world can be a better place. Uh, rather than simply a place where we have to sacrifice some of the things that we, we already have. I think that's uh, probably the most important thing we need to do to make the transition to a more sustainable and desirable future, is to create this third movie uh, that shows how we can all be better off, how we can all be happier, have a higher
quality of life and well-being if we, uh, if we move in the right direction. This one quote by Thomas Friedman that, in fact, and some of the mainstream uh, commentators are beginning to get the message that this recession that we're still in since, 19, since 2008 is, is something more than just another uh, recession. Uh, we're not going to get back to the business as usual um, status. And in fact, business as usual has been called the, um, the utopian fantasy, not the kind of world that we're, we're trying to create. Um, the next slide shows um, the model that we're still operating under, or most policy decisions are made under. The, the, the idea that we still live in an empty world where um, <clears throat> humans, um, uh, the human economy can expand forever, where more is always better, where uh, these three major types of capital, land, labor, and manufactured capital, are all perfectly substitutable. Uh, so we can't run out of natural resources, and we can just keep growing the economy uh, forever. The scale of the economy is not an issue. There's not, you know, there, there are no planetary boundaries. We can solve all these problems with technology. Um, <clears throat> poverty can best be solved with more growth. Uh, everything will trickle down. Nature is really a sideshow in this view of the world. And private property is always the best way to, to manage these kinds of resources. And uh, individual utility, welfare, uh, well-being is, is really mainly a function of the absolute level of consumption. So the more we consume, the better off we are. Um, of course, <clears throat> that is the model that I think needs to be replaced. If you go to the next slide, this is a... Um, maybe a more accurate representation of what we now know about uh, the role of the economy, in quotes, uh, in the larger system. Uh, uh, recognizing that this larger system is a materially closed one, uh, you know, everything has to go somewhere, we can't continue to grow the economy in a material sense on a finite planet, that <clears throat> um, these four types of capital are all required in some balanced way to produce any kind of benefits or well-being for people. Our natural, our human, our social, and our manufactured capital, and certainly the social and human and natural capital components have been underplayed in the conventional economic thinking. And, and um, another important aspect is that human well-being uh, at both the individual and the community scale is a much more complicated function than simply the more we consume, the better off we are. And I think that's what um, this conference is is here to talk about. What is the, what is that? <laughs> it's hard to talk without any feedback. Okay, got the message, John. Thanks. <laughs> Keep sending text messages if I'm if I begin to stray. Uh, so, and I'll try to finish uh, by two, as you say and go through this relatively quickly. Okay, so anyway, um, <clears throat> the point I want to make with this diagram too is that, that in order to develop this sustainable well-being, we have to understand how this whole system functions. Um, we can't remain too focused on any one element of it. We have to understand the connections between human well-being, the perception of that well-being, and uh, the functioning of the, the rest of the biophysical and economic system. Next slide. So this is this. These are the elements that I think need to be incorporated in in this uh, in this research going forward. Um, the subjective well-being side, uh, which I think will be the focus of your your meeting here. How do people perceive their happiness, their well-being, their welfare, uh, and what are some ways of of uh, looking at that through surveys and other methods? Uh, basic human needs uh, that people are. Trying to fulfill, and there's a, a long list of those. It goes well beyond subsistence and reproduction. It includes affection, understanding, participation. So, um, <clears throat> this this field of understanding what basic human needs are and how people weight this, the fulfillment of those needs to feel subjective satisfaction, uh, but also what are the opportunities that people have to meet those needs now and in the future. And that's where the analysis of our built human, social, and natural capital assets and and how we use our time uh, comes in. Uh, so. You know, all of these elements have subjective and objective uh, components, um, and I think our challenge is really to integrate uh, across this whole picture to get a better understanding of what quality of life, well-being, happiness really is, and how we can improve it in the future, and how we can how we can sustain it. Um, subjectively, there are, there are limitations. People don't perceive everything that contributes to their well-being, particularly uh, contributions from natural capital. Um, they, um, you know, they discount the future far too much. There's a lot, a lot of information these out these days about you know, human psychology and how we, how we do perceive things, and and uh, we need to to um, to understand the limits of that perception, 
uh, but also to adequately take it into account and try to and try to move forward. Next slide. So this one should be in two parts. First, you see the the planetary boundaries. If you if you advance one one more slide, then you'll see the elements of human well-being within those planetary boundaries. And what we're trying to do is is to meet all of those needs for health, for community, for education, fairness, identity, freedom, etc., uh, ecosystem services, um, and uh, but but stay within the planetary boundaries. So we have the sustainable and desirable donut, as it's been called by by Oxfam. Uh, that is really our our goal going forward. How do we get into and stay in uh, the donut? Next slide. We know that GDP and consumption uh, affects life satisfaction subjectively up to a point. Uh, it saturates at a relatively low level of of, uh, of uh, GDP per capita, and so we could be we could all be much better off with some of the richer countries consuming less and allowing more space for some of the poor countries to consume more and getting the right balance between those four different types of capital shows how we measure well-being. Uh, we've been stuck on GDP as a measure, but it's really only designed as a measure of, of economic activity and only the marketed part of that. So we need to move from the sort of pink area of that slides over into the blue and the green areas where we measure at least economic welfare, where we subtract the costs from the benefits. And ultimately, how do we measure human well-being, human welfare, how well human needs are actually being assessed, and some of the subjective um, survey methods that you're talking about will fit into that category. Uh, I won't go into the details here, but this is just what goes into one of these alternatives, the Genuine Progress Indicator, which is in the, the blue column. This is an economic welfare measure, uh, but it's interesting because it has been calculated for several countries and it shows very different results than uh, traditional GDP. You can see all the things that are subtracted from GDP that are currently in there that shouldn't be and a few things that are, that are added to account for uh, social capital, natural capital, and, uh, and human capital uh, components. This is how it looks for the, the, uh, the U.S. Uh, over the last several decades. GDP has continued going up. GPI uh, leveled off in about 1975 and has remained relatively constant ever since then. So we're, we're pursuing the wrong goals. We're, we're looking for maximizing activity, GDP. We should be looking for maximizing genuine progress, well-being, uh, sustainability, etc. GPI is not the perfect indicator, but it's certainly a lot better than the alternatives. Next slide shows an, a study we did in Vermont showing that uh, their GPI uh, continued to increase even though the U.S. average was, was uh, leveling off and going down. Um, <clears throat> the next slide shows that Maryland has recently adopted the GPI as one of their official um, government indicators. It's, one of the, it's the first government uh, official government body to do so. The state of Vermont has recently followed suit. In fact, they legislated uh, by mandate that the GPI will be calculated for Vermont. Uh, the next slide shows the Maryland website. They did a really good job of explaining this, I think, and uh, so I encourage you to go take a look at that their website. Um, <clears throat> the next slide shows a study that we recently did for Oregon to calculate um, their GPI right, and compare that with Maryland, with the U.S. and uh, with Maryland and the U.S. in this in this slide, showing that uh, <clears throat> Oregon was also increasing their GPI until fairly until about 2000 when it leveled off. Uh, even though the U.S. leveled off in about 1975, Maryland's been going up and down, but also has has been uh, turning downward towards the end. Um, next slide shows more recently we've been comparing in, uh, countries for uh, according to a whole range of different indicators, and this is just four of the countries that we've compared: the U.S., Sweden, China, and Poland. And it shows indicators of GPI, GDP, ecological footprint, uh, biocapacity, and life satisfaction to show how they've been changing. You can see that in, in almost every case, GDP has been increasing. China is, is increasing phenomenally, but their GPI leveled off in around 2000, uh, in around 1995. Um, and uh, their life satisfaction has been uh, headed, headed down in most, in most cases, uh, or at least level. <clears throat> um, the next slide shows, uh, I think, the first estimate of the global GPI per capita. These are some preliminary numbers, but you can see that like the U.S., there was a peak in around 1978 in this case, and after which global GPI has actually decreased quite significantly. So, again, GPI is not the perfect measure. I think we, we need to work more on better measures and more comprehensive measures of well-being, but it certainly gives a very different picture from what you normally see. The next slide shows the importance of income inequality uh, to various um, measures of well-being from the work by Wilkinson and Pickett. 
Uh, you've probably all seen this. You can see the U.S. way out there in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, high income inequality, high uh, index of social social problems. So the solutions here are somewhat are somewhat obvious. Uh, we need to work more on our social capital. We need to work more on our natural capital. Uh, we need to pursue genuine progress, sustainable well-being, rather than merely uh, GDP and economic growth. So the next slide. Uh, the bottom line is this continued growth is not sustainable. We're bumping into planetary boundaries. It does not necessarily improve well-being, happiness, however you want to define it. Uh, and so we need to change our ways. <clears throat> the next slide shows that uh, back to Bhutan, uh, they've been very uh, active in pursuing this in a whole range of different ways, both uh, pursuing the subjective well-being surveys, uh, but also more recently we were involved with them in, in trying to account for their natural capital assets and their ecosystem services. The next slide shows um, uh, the initial, we did an initial estimate of those assets uh, showing that they're uh, they are, they are very large, con considerably larger than their GDP. And many of them are exported to people outside of Bhutan in the way of, of uh, water supply and carbon sequestration, et cetera. And Bhutan is committed to maintaining those services in, in perpetuity. Uh, the next slide shows a report that we just finished uh, that might be uh, a good, well, that I think is a good summary of some of these ideas. And I encourage you to take a look at this. Um, we recognize some of the, the, the co-authors there. The idea here was how do we synthesize all of this information about what a sustainable and desirable economy embedded in society, embedded in nature actually looks like, what's our vision for that future, and what are some uh, detailed policy recommendations for how to move towards that, that society. Uh, the next slide shows that Yes, there will always be skeptics, uh, and the guy in the back saying, yes, what if it's all a big hoax and we create this better world for nothing? So the point is, um, I think we need to refocus our attention much more on what that better world looks like and give people a, um, a positive vision of the future where, where their well-being and happiness and sustainability and fairness and all of those ac uh, attributes that we're talking about uh, are, really, are really there. Uh, but uh, it's not enough to just do that in an analytical way. I think we have to, to present pictures and, and, and uh, narratives and visions and movies and however we can communicate uh, what that world um, might look like uh, because people are motivated by, uh, by a positive vision and there really isn't a coherent one out there. And that has to be also developed, I think, in a, uh, in a shared way. <clears throat> the next slide shows that I think uh, what some of the long-term solutions um, to this flourishing, uh, human flourishing on a biophysically limited planet, uh, we have to break our addiction to this growth at all cost economic paradigm. So it's, it seems obvious uh, that we should, uh, but like any addiction, these things, um, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> it's very difficult uh, to break addictions. And the worst thing you can say to an addict is that, you know, they're just doing the wrong thing and they just have to stop and start doing something different. You get, you get uh, pushback and denial and just the kinds of things that we're getting at the societal level uh, when we suggest that things have got to change quickly. So we have to take that into account and recognize that the way we frame things and um, that a positive framing and envisioning a more, more sustainable future uh, that focuses on well-being, happiness, all the things that people really do want um, rather than just consumption, which most people understand uh, they don't want necessarily more of. Uh, that, that's, <clears throat> that's the way forward. Ultimately, we have, it's going to require this completely new vision, new measures, new institutions, new technologies, a whole redesign, uh, but it's certainly not a sacrifice to do that. It's a sacrifice not to. And the uh, next to last slide just shows that uh, we have some, um, some new venues for having that discussion of what a sustainable and desirable future uh, might look like. And I hope you all take a look at this, uh, this magazine, which is available uh, for free online as well, and, uh, and contribute um, your, your solutions uh, to, to us. And the last slide is the end. Thank you.